Welcome to Confirmation Bias, presented by the League Ambassadors. I'm Ambassador Kenny Ken Ken, and Tampa Bay reliever Sergio Romo became the first pitcher in over 35 years to start a baseball game in consecutive days after pitching at least one inning from the previous day. Baseball pitching rotations, as we know it, are coming to an end. And that's my confirmation bias. I'm Ambassador Junior Blue, and I'm headed to Vegas this weekend, and I think I might have to pick up a Vegas Knights hat or something, <laughs> because their games be on fire, and that's my confirmation bias. First off, uh, birthday shout out to my only son, Miles. Uh, happy birthday. Uh, I'm Ambassador Dad. And Kevin Durant is out here living his best life. Not only is he French frying the Rockets, but he's also brokering very big charity deals with my man Bobby Axelrod on the show Billions. And that's my confirmation bias. And I'm Ambassador Chef Curry. And in the infamous words of Michael Jordan, Ray J., and now Milwaukee Bucks Sterling Brown, release the tapes. And that's my confirmation bias. Welcome to Confirmation Bias. This is episode 51, second season of our show. Uh, as a reminder, you can follow us everywhere on social media. Our handle is at the League AM. Uh, that's Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Uh, also, please check out our website, theleagueam.com, uh, and our blog spot online, Diplomatic Community, which is on our website. Uh, and that is the place where if you are a sports fan and you've got something to say, please make a contribution. Uh, to the community. Uh, also, please check out our YouTube channel and subscribe. Uh, that is the League Ambassadors. Uh, we've got a good show today. We've got some ponies. We've hmm. got some auto racing. We've got some hockey. Uh, so let's get the show going. Dad, what's cracking, sir? What's going on, guys? Uh, so let's jump into hot topics. Uh, let's first get started with the NBA Conference Finals. Uh, right now, we have the Cavs and Celtics tied at two games apiece. Uh, we also have the Warriors playing right now. Um, I need someone to check the score, but they they lead two to one at home. Um, and the biggest thing that has been going on with these particular uh, playoff series is that no games have been close down the stretch. Uh, mm -hmm. We have in the uh, Eastern Conference Finals the average margin of victory is 19 points. Mm -hmm. uh, in the Western Conference Finals, it's been 25 points. And we've had uh, the highest blowout be 41 points. Mm -hmm. And then yep. the uh, the closest game was 9 points. So the question I want to pose to the guys uh, so we can get this, uh, this started is, why are we having so many lopsided games here in the Conference Finals? Uh, is it the style of play? Why, why are we here at this point where it's all ass whippings all the time? We at the same place we were last year at this time, honestly. Um, you have one team, the Warriors, who's who's a better team than the Rockets. And you see when the Warriors take their foot off the gas, they go up 2-0 in series and then they lose game three. And that's kind of how they, how things are going. And I don't think it's the style of play that's producing the blowouts. It's NBA players, they don't play hard all the time. And you see it, and it shows up in games. Well, the reason why I say style of play, uh, and I'll, I'll go to you, Kev, next, is to me it seems like with the way that the games go, if you're on, you're on, and then and then that's where these blowouts are going. Or if you're off, you're off, you're getting spanked. Yeah, I mean, it's – I don't think, well, to go to Les's point, but you look at the, the Eastern Conference, you have the Celtics who appear to be the better all-around team, but then they lack experience. And you have Cleveland who – 
relies heavily on one style of play, but they're more experienced. So in instances where you need a run or you need a bucket, they have the ability to get it. But I think the problem, I think it is to an extent, it is style of play or, or, or makeup rather or personnel because you see how, how Houston plays. And if they continue to play like they played in 90% of the first half of this game tonight, they're going to get blown out. But then they ended up turning the tables around, move the ball, actually attack the mismatch, use the pick and roll, not just to get James Harden to dribble the ball out to the end of the shot clock. So I think when you know these teams actually play to play to their strengths instead of what necessarily they were able to hang their hat on in the regular season, you'll see games start to flip, teams go on runs, and then you get what we have here where Houston actually leads going into the half. Yeah, I think I think volatility, at least in the Western Conference matchup, the, 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 the style of play is very volatile. And what I mean by that is you have these huge runs. Steph Curry went on a personal run by himself <laughs> in Game 3, uh, 17, I think, or in 20, 21 points, I think, in the third quarter. Um, and so I think long shots, fast, fast break, fast pace, and if teams are turning the ball over, which turnovers have factored into uh, every blowout that's happened in the Western Conference, in, in, mm-hmm. in Golden State's lone loss, they had, I believe, seven turnovers in the first three minutes of the game, yeah. um, and that sort of set the tempo. So I think style of play does matter, and I think I agree with Kevin. In, in, the, in the Eastern Conference, I think it's just strictly uh, experience because you look at the game last night even with Boston and Cleveland. Again, Boston missed about 16, 17 layups dunks, which, you know, it, from, my pers- got blocked. from my perspective, <laughs> Yeah. From my perspective, they were very tight um, and, and they lacked offensive execution, which if they had executed, just made even half of those layups. It's a different ball game. But I think the lack of experience shows up for them. Um, and I think that's why they've had the blowouts there. And then and, and frankly, like you said, Kevin, I think they are the better overall team. So they're going to play well and they have played well at home. I don't believe they've actually lost at home yet in the playoffs, uh, but they're one in seven on the road so yeah. far. So with, with the two points that you guys made, um, it's clear to me anyway that when teams are actually moving the ball that they win games. Uh, Boston came out in game one and they were executing the shit out of their offense. And I was like, if they execute, like I don't see this series changing at all. But then you have games like last night uh, in the first quarter and they're just playing hero ball and just chucking it up. And then they get behind. And then I think that's what kind of shot them in the foot. So... I, uh, youth and experience has something to do with it, but if you're a well-coached team, as we all have said that the Boston Celtics are, why is it that you have these times specifically on the road when you're not executing and you're not doing what you're supposed to do? I mean, you can see the same thing for for Houston. I mean, and Golden State falls into the same trap as well. Well, because you're because uh, well, youth and experience does play into it because you don't necessarily know how to deal with the pressure, like. As you progress in the playoffs and as a series continues to unfold and develop, there is pressure that happens. And it and, and contrary to what Dan Tony said, I think it happens for both teams. Contrary to everything he always it, 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 it happens it, it happens for both teams in a series. Well for Boston, this is really the first time that they've been in this element, especially with those pieces. Well, and they have their key players are very young players. And so if you are feeling pressure, it's no different than, you know, if you need to give a speech or you need to, any type of performance if you're feeling pressure, you're not going to always hit the mark. And that's where that shows up. So when you talk about offensive execution and running plays and 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 following whatever your procedure and your protocol is, that pressure from lack of experience can cause you to miss your mark. And now, so I think I think the pressure what happens with the pressure is they revert back to what they did for most of their lives. Mm-hmm. You got to remember, most of these kids were raised on Kobe, raised off watching Jordan. And that was a lot of one on one. And, you know, coming up playing, you do a lot of one-on-one stuff mm-hmm. when you're playing pickup games, when you're in practice, you do a lot of one-on-one things. So when that pressure rises, what do you revert back to? You don't revert back to, you know, the plays that you're running, yeah. execution like that. You're like, let me just be – like, you think about it like this. If your threes aren't falling, mm-hmm. you want to do what? You want to get to the basket. Mm-hmm. A, lot of the exec- a lot of the plays aren't made for that. for that. So what they do is, let me get to the basket, and how am I going to get there? One-on-one. And then, you know, then all of a sudden, now you're talking about teams playing defense against you, and now it's a struggle. And you play a tick yeah. faster than you would normally play. The yep. tempo is sped up a little bit more than all what you would normally do. All those missed layups and dunks yeah, Exactly, yeah. exactly. And it's, it's also a matter of, well, we got to give credit to the coaches as well as making adjustments based on what you see and whether it be the first half of a game or the first two games of a series. 
Like um, we saw in what was that game three, I believe, when the uh, it was either two or three where Houston just was going at Steph Curry. And for this first half, it's like, man, what are they going to do? Like it's a mismatch. He's clearly smaller. Um, you know, it's not a lack of effort on his part. It's just he's a smaller defender going up against bigger guys. And then you see how uh, Golden State came out in the second half and made those adjustments. Draymond would fight around the screen. They would put get Steph on a mismatch. And then that weak side defender would always come over and help. Steph would then and go run and play weak side. So they made those adjustments. Made adjustments. But then you look at what Boston did the other night when Roger got switched off on LeBron, and they were just like, the whole hey, first good luck half. down there. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that's, that, that's, and then, and, and then and that's, come help them. And that's one of my questions. Like, uh, it's, it's, I guess it's in now for, for teams to switch everything. And it doesn't all, you have to have the right personnel to be able I to do that. I completely agree. And Golden State doesn't always have the lineup where they can do that, but they're able to make adjustments. Boston, as great as Brad Stevens is, like, they were just content with LeBron just eating him for lunch. Well, it's it was a three-point shot. Yeah, it, 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 was odd, it was an odd thing, too, because when the, when the game won, actually, Cleveland's first few possessions, Boston was switching everything. And then they stopped the switching, and they stayed home, and that mm-hmm. changed everything for them defensively. So they had been going with that. It, I, it was curious to me as to why they went back to the switching, because then, as you said, they then started to exploit the matchup, particularly with Ro- Rozier. Particularly only. <laughs> but, but, but. <laughs> Exclusively. To, but, to your, but, to your, but to your point, though, and that's why, especially with last night's game, I, I put more of the, the blame or more of the emphasis on Boston's offense. Outside of LeBron's 44, the only thing that hurt them was Kyle Korver's 14 points, and a lot of that came in the first half. Mm. It was their lack of execution, I think, on the offensive end. So I think if you're Brad Stevens and we come back in Game 5 and it's the same sort of situation where LeBron has 44 and Korver has 14 and you get help from no one else, I think it's a dramatically different game from Boston's perspective. Plus you, you, it's going to be at home where the role players always play better, right? And right. especially young players too, right? and their right. stars are young. So Speaking of other uh, facets of the game, so... Do you guys think that officiating is playing a part of it? Um, the reason why I say that is specifically in the Eastern Conference. If you look at the first two games in Boston, uh, the Cavs averaged 18 free throws through the first two games mm-hmm. and Celtics 16. Mm-hmm. Games three and four in Cleveland, they jumped to 29 free throws a game for both. Mm-hmm. Do you think that's a result of, oh shit, NBA, Cleveland's down 2-0, Let's kind of muck this up. I mean, I, I hate to play conspiracy theorist, but how do you how do you almost double the amount of free throws that you're taking? I just think, I think it's the, the same series. Yeah. Well, the whistle will always go to the team that's more aggressive, or as they say, or attacks the basket. Um, but I think with with Cleveland, a knock we've always given to LeBron is like, yo, you're the biggest thing we've seen on the court. Get in the post. So I think they go down 0-2. He realized oh, shit, in order for me to either be more efficient, more productive in the fourth quarter to get my teammates involved, we have to play inside out. And you see that with with LeBron. You see it sometimes with Jeff Green, even though it doesn't work, with Kevin Love. Uh, They go inside out, and they end up getting that whistle. And on the other end, Boston's facing a deficit. They come down, and they're more inclined to jack up threes, take bad shots, which leads to transition on the other end, probably a foul at the rim. Other team gets the whistle again. Desperation, mm-hmm. desperation for different reasons, right? Cleveland's down 0-2. They're desperate, so they're going to go attack the basket. Boston has in-game desperation because they're trying to come back, and desperation leads to more aggression, which then leads to more foul calls. Speaking of desperation, there's nothing more desperate than a boxing match because a <laughs> motherfucker's swinging at your face. <laughs> so, that was uh, good, that Devin. I like right that, there. Devin. So, uh, <laughs> that over was the... a 50 cent segue. <laughs> <laughs> So over the weekend, uh, Badu Jack fought longtime uh, light heavyweight champion Adonis Stevenson for mm-hmm. his light heavyweight championship. Uh, they fought to a draw. It was a really, really good fight. Um, Did you agree? That was my question. Uh, yes. You agree I, with the I agree. draw? Um, I agree with the draw. Um, it was an interesting fight, um, but I felt like it was a tale of two completely different fights. Mm-hmm. Uh, so just to give some some uh, some input on it, uh Jack was not active up until the seventh round, and because of his inactivity, Stevenson was able to outpoint him in those rounds. Um, but then, when Jack picked it up in the seventh round, it was a wrap, and he was beating the shit out of Adonis Stevenson. Right, he might have lost one of those rounds. So the reason why I bring that up is because it was a draw. But if if this was on the schoolyard, and it was after school, and they were fighting, Badu Jack won. Badu Jack won that fight. Yeah, yeah. So. Boxing has been the same way for a long, long time. Do you think they should consider 
tweaking some of the rules of judging, considering that we've had we had we've had terrible decisions, specifically in major fights with Canelo and Triple G. No one agreed with that score. Um, should they consider tweaking it? I don't know. I mean, I feel like uh, you know, I I think. I'm okay with with the score of that fight, and we've seen other fights like that where one mm. fight, one fighter clearly starts slow, and usually the intention or the thought, the strategy behind that is the fighter who is starting slow thinks that their opponent is a fader, mm. right? So the idea is get him into the deep water. Um, the only problem with that, particularly from Badu Jack's perspective, is that you have to be active. You can't just merely be standing across the ring. And if mm. you, and in fact, if you do some early work, right, that only will expedite the fighter Especially from fading. If you go to the body. Exactly. So mm. um, I'm I'm okay with that. And you know, if the strategy works, a la the way that it did for say Mayweather Maidana one, mm -hmm. where Mayweather did some early work, but it was clear he was trying to get Maidana into the, the deep, deep water. water. Um, then you reward that, and then the fighter wins. I think in Badu Jack's case, he didn't do any work, really, mm. in those first early rounds. And so then you come out with the draw. So, I mean, I'm fine with, with, with that fight being scored that way. I do I mm. do agree with you. Like, subconsciously, we all know yeah. who won the fight. Just like uh, Danny Garcia and... Um, exactly. Um, Lamont Lamont Peterson. Lamont Peterson. Exactly. If he, did, if he didn't throw away the first four rounds, he didn't want to fight Kev. Well, I have to admit to our fans, I personally did not watch. This <laughs> <laughs> but, Me either. But it sounds it sounds like one of the common themes, one of my criticisms of boxing, um, and Devin, it, it goes back to the old Rasheen Wayne fight. It's like, mm. how do we determine what winning a fight is? Is it who lands the most punches, who controls the pace, who lands the most effective punches? And for judges, I'm sure they all have their different ideas of who did each one of those, whether it's a combination or just each individual aspect. So... Yeah, I mean, you consider, should they change how we look at this? I mean, you guys watch more boxing than I do, but do you think that's a factor that judges determine who wins fights different ways? Well, they, they do, but they shouldn't. They should all be grading on the same scale. That's the problem. And that's where politics, ever happen. politics comes into play. But uh, and before we get out of here and move to our next segment, uh, Slug taught me a long time ago how to watch a fight because the way I would watch a fight is I would normally pay attention to the face of the person that I wanted to lose so I could see my guy land the punches. When I started watching it down the middle or watching fights opposite so I can see the difference in the fight, I saw, I saw fights in a different light. I thought uh, De La Hoya versus Mosley 2, I thought De La Hoya actually won that fight until I watched it again, and Shane beat that ass. Um, but uh, who knows if they'll ever change that. It's similar to Ward Kovalev. I think yeah. Ward Kovalev's first fight, it was the same sort of fight, and I think, you know, it's... When you talk about tempo, when you talk about who's controlling the fight, even that's subjective because the question would be, even though Badu Jack didn't have any effort and intensity the first seven rounds, mm. you could argue he was controlling the tempo because he wanted to get the fight later. So then how exactly. do you score that? Right. Okay, on to black versus blue. First up, we have uh, the Washington Capitals <laughs> forcing a game seven after being up 2-0 in the series. <laughs> <laughs> so... Say that again. <laughs> they had to force the game seven <laughs> after after being up 2-0. <laughs> so is it hope or hype that they will finally punch through? What do you guys think? Well, fuck all y'all looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> you know why. Listen, these are not my captains. The closest hockey team to me. But look, I, they deserve credit for forcing this game seven because they could have laid down and, and reverted back to the same capitals we've been criticizing them for. But they played desperate hockey in game six with whatever that appears to be, but they ended up winning a uh, three Oh and, and forcing the tempo. I'm, I don't know, bro. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm conflicted here because you look at, okay, wild guess. What team has the worst game seven record in NHL history? The caps, <laughs> right? <laughs> Which team has the best game seven record in NHL history? Tampa Bay. So history is not on their side, but damn it, if they don't do it this year, it ain't ever going to get done. <laughs> uh, Relegation. Desperate, des well, desperate hockey looks like you out hit a team, you out shoot a team, which those are things that Washington did uh, mm -hmm. by significant margins in game six. Um, you know, I think John Cooper said it best. He's the coach of Tampa Bay. Um, and I think it's true really of any sport. 
with the exception of maybe baseball, I think you could argue baseball, but for any other sport, game sevens go to the home team. And it's and it is especially true in hockey. I think Tampa Bay wins. Um and yeah, I mean let's not talk about game sevens in baseball. Mm. At home. I know. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I said I and right, that's why uh, I said and that's why I said <laughs> moving on uh, this, <laughs> Leslie, I, I think it's I think it's hype. Uh because I have to see it to believe it and they just haven't done it and, and wouldn't it just be the most capitals thing ever to be up two O in the conference finals? And lose a game seven. The only thing more capital would be if they got up 2-0 in the game and lost 3-2. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? All right. So next up we have hit or flop. Danica Patrick is racing her last Indy 500. Will that be a hit for the her, for the sport, anything? Uh, it's a hit as in it's a bad thing. Uh, it's a flop because it's going to be a flop for NASCAR, for the auto racing industry. You lose Dale Earnhardt last year. Now you lose Danica. You're losing the faces of your of your sport. But the, the question I got is, I mean, are we really going to miss Danica? Is anybody really going to miss Danica? Seven top ten finishes. She only won the pole once out of 191 races. She had a fourth place finish in her rookie year of the Indianapolis 500. I mean, unless another woman comes along, I don't even think that we're going to really remember her in ten years. I think it's a hit for the simple fact that uh, the question was, is the base is the race a big deal? So for her leaving being her last one yes because she's the biggest female in the sport um i think it's interesting to the sport in itself because she's basically leaving because lack of sponsorship and her concussion issues which is she's following right in the footsteps of dale jr so i think that's huge yeah i I hate to say it man but i'm kind of waiting for her career to be over and it sounds so bad <laughs> especially after the show we had last week but it's like much ado oh. about nothing <laughs> i mean we, we just we wanted i think we all just wanted more and i know that's not necessarily fair you know given you know she she broke through the ceiling and, and she deserves credit for that but i think it just never lived up to it on the track so now for it to be coming to an end it's just like all right that was i guess it was cute but like it, it just never at the end of the day did the results add up as far as winning, and it, it didn't. I, it, I hate to say it. It was cute, Kevin. Bless <laughs> <laughs> mm. Just call it how you see it. <laughs> so let's go. <laughs> uh, newsworthy and nothing to see. NFL OTA started, and we have some pretty notable absences and appearances. Um, you have Brady Gronk out. Uh, Khalil Mack is out. Mm. That's personal mm. favorite. Um, <laughs> uh, ODB showed up. So mm. is this newsworthy or nothing to see? It's nothing to see. This happens every year. I agree. Enough said. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's all they all got, all, and they all have one thing in common. Well, I think Brady's might not necessarily be about money, but it's about every, power. Everybody else, yep. every, everything else, it's just about money. I, th- I think it's newsworthy for a couple reasons. Well, for the same basis, but different re- reasons. ODB showed up, I think, to show his maturity, dedication. But at the end of the day, he's trying to get that uh, that big contract. And that's what people are expecting of him uh, to kind of take that next step in his personal life. But then you look at guys like Le'Veon and Julio and what's happened hmm. in the offseason. Uh, Aaron Donald, I mean, these are all guys who want their contract as well. So I think they're showing that team with their absence how important they are, hopefully, they get paid. At the end of the day, it's all about money. Whether the, you show up or don't. The Rams pay the man. Yeah, well. We are going to move on to our Is You With It or Nah debate segment. Kenyon promised we talk about some horses. So <laughs> Ponies. Ponies. <laughs> ponies. So ponies. Ponies. Does anyone have a coin? <laughs> Omar's well, after the, uh, I'm thinking of a number. <laughs> <laughs> one or two, one or two. Uh, after the wet and rainy Preakness uh, from this past weekend, Justified now has two of the three legs of the Triple Crown. Uh, he needs to win, I believe, what's next week? Belmont, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Two weeks. Two weeks and two weeks. So with that being said, Devin, Les, between you two, is the Triple Crown still relevant? And I will leave it to Kenyon. Looks like he has something in his hand to mm-hmm. decide who picks what into this debate. Kenyon, uh, you flip. Less is your choice. Less is your choice. Tails. Never fails. Mm, 
uh, not relevant. Not relevant, not Kevin. Relevant. Devin, you want to go first, or are you leaving that up to Les? I'll leave it up to Big Brother Sodom Nunsi. He can go first. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. And give me a second. We almost All right, ready. Let's see here. I'm ready to go. <laughs> Rock and roll. All right. No, the Triple Crown <laughs> is not relevant <laughs> to the general public. And they don't want it to be. Horse racing has been dubbed the sport of kings and caters to the one percenters in sports betters. The Kentucky Derby, Belmont Stakes, and Preakness are the NBA Finals World Series and Super Bowl of their sports. The NBA Finals games has more viewership than one min- than a one-minute race, and that's with us knowing the outcome of last year's series between the Golden State Warriors and the Cleveland Cavs. The Super Bowl more than doubles the viewership of all three races combined. This is just a sport that is not available to the general public. There are parks with basketball courts and baseball fields all over the city. There are fields where football games can be played. Playing these sports make them more relevant as you grow up and become adults. The people that the sport is relevant to are the one percenters who are able to spend a million plus on a horse and over 200K a month to maintain the horse. It costs 50K just to enter one of the Triple Crown races. They put all this time and money into winning the Triple Crown to increase the stud fee, and that's all that matters to them. The last Triple Crown winner, 200K for each healthy foal that is studded from the winner, Mm. and is currently due $20 million. Mm. Can most sports fan even name the last Triple Crown winner? So how can it even be relevant? So it's not relevant at all. Thank you, Les. That was short and sweet as always. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Dev. It's on you, man. Okay, so uh, first off, I just want to do a quick shout out to uh, my grandmother and her track buddy, uh, Mr. Bobby Owens, rest in peace, for taking me <laughs> to the racetrack when I was little. Uh, growing up in one of the home cities for the Triple Crown is definitely still relevant to me. Uh, the Preakness Stakes is a huge deal for the city of Baltimore. For a whole three minutes, the entire country is paying attention to Baltimore in a positive note, which doesn't always happen. Uh, black, crea- black creativity is at an all-time high during the Preakness, trying to capitalize off the event, so I admit I'm a little biased. The fact that winning the Triple Crown has only been done 12 times in 143 attempts shows that it's a tough feat to accomplish. Uh, three years ago was the first time in my lifetime that I was able to actually see a Triple Crown win. I thought I'd never see one given the fact that I've been alive for 12, and I remember 10 horses who won the first two legs of the Triple Crown and failed in the third attempt. Let's also not forget about the main reason why people even watch horse racing to begin with, and that's the gamblers. Uh, In 2017, betting in North America throughout the Triple Crown uh, brought in $139 million, which was up $15 million from the year before. Uh, Even with bad weather at the actual uh, event in Churchill Downs, even though the numbers were down for people attending because of that, it did not uh, deter them away from the betting window because uh, they enjoyed a $9 million bump at the window. Uh, Vegas Sportsbook takes in about an average of $33 million a month on all bets. During the month of May, that increases to $44 million, basically because of these horse races. So anytime Vegas wins and increases revenue, that means something is important. And when it's a feat that is uh, hardly ever accomplished and it's a part of history and we can witness that, that makes it still relevant. It's a good debate. Wow, thank you for that jewel, Omar. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> i never gotten that topic without you. <laughs> you guys actually did make, make great points. I'm going to say going into this, I did think, I did think like uh, like Les did, you know, definitely being in Baltimore, seeing how. First off, the Preakness is in the hood. For anyone who didn't know, yes, but <laughs> West. The entire country basically shuts off West Baltimore for the rich, white, and privileged to have fun, act a fool, throw mud at each other, break shit, do things that black people get arrested for all the time, um, without any type of reprimand. Um, but at the same time, you see the impact that betting has. Um, I mean, it led to the great show Peaky Blinders. So, you know, I think that it has its ups and its downs, but I'm going to side with less. I, I, I think the, oh, I think oh. the triple crown the is... I did, man. I just... 
I dropped, I I dropped Mr. I hate... Bobby and everything in there. You did. Damn. I... I love all of them. Kevin, you must I, I be really... ready to move out. Come on home. <laughs> hey, I didn't, I didn't say all that. I just, I see what it does to communities and living here. It's only for a specific part of people that would never go to Park Heights. The one percenters. Well, I don't know. Mr. Four days out the year. My, my grandmother and Mr. Bobby were not part of the one percent, and we was at Pimlico a lot. <laughs> that was then. <laughs> that was the 80s. Yeah, yeah, you, don't, you don't live in Baltimore in 2018. Uh, Kevin, before we get out of here, do we have anything in diplomatic immunity? We do. A couple things we wanted to hit on. The uh, NBA first team, the rookie first team uh, was selected. You got uh, Donovan Mitchell, Ben Simmons, Jason Tatum, Kyle Kuzma, and Lori Markinen. You guys got any feelings, any feel any type of way about who deserved, didn't deserve to be elected on the team? That sound good to me. Yeah, it's yeah, it's fair. Yeah, it's so pretty good. good. I don't know if anyone got a chance to look at Brett Favre's Monday morning quarterback interview. I did. He, yeah, yeah, yeah. I oh read pretty God. good. Yeah, yeah. He was off the pills. Uh, my chest. He was off the pills. <laughs> Is that touching your pearls? If, I, I believe it was. If people knew, if people said they want to be the MVP, if they knew what it took to be the MVP, they wouldn't want That's to do it. Would not sign up for it. He and was last on but not least, highway to hell. <laughs> it was announced that. Uh, Serena Williams, we talked about her um, last show. Serena Williams is going to be unseated at the French Open after not playing since her pregnancy. You guys think that's a slight or because she's been missing for some months that that's a that's a solid decision made by those up above? She'll be fine. Yeah. I, I think, I mean, it is warranted. <laughs> I mean, she was out for, you know, giving birth. Yeah. Bringing I, life. I mean, I think, yeah, I think they're making it, I, th- I feel like they're trying to make that a women's rights issue because she was out for pregnancy and not an injury. But I mean, if you look at golf, if you're, if you're inactive, you're frankly, not, you can't be ranked. You can't be ranked. So, and, and to me, I see it as the same thing. It's not an indictment on skill. And for someone like Serena Williams, that's mm-hmm. better than anybody that she's going to face. If anything, it's bad news for the higher yep. seed players yeah, that she's going to have to play earlier in the tournament. Yeah. yeah. So when she wins the tournament unseated she gonna fuck some people's holidays up and that's another another feather in the another cap for the her cap. yeah that's all we got Kev? that's all we got yep all right well this has been another episode of confirmation bias again follow us everywhere on social media our handle is at the league am also check out our website the league am.com please subscribe to our youtube channel league ambassadors uh, we will see you actually in a week. We're off for the holiday. We'll see you next week where we should know who's going to be in the NBA Finals, the NHL Finals. Uh, yeah. Cheerio. Vegas, baby. See y'all next week. Warriors up five. One, two, three, can't cool. <laughs> <laughs>